Well, I am super excited to start this new semester together. Uh, if we haven't met, my name is Sydney. I get to serve as the college and young adults pastor here. Um, my husband, Aaron, is right back there. Couldn't do this without him. Um, so <laughs> I went to UMHV, uh, graduated a few years back. I was a public relations major. Any public relations majors in the room? Yeah. Um, never thought that I would be a pastor, but here we are, and I just feel so privileged to get to be here with you guys. Um, so we are going to be studying a book of the Bible together this semester. Sometimes we do a topical series. I like to kind of rotate back and forth. Last semester, we did a study on relationships, all different types of relationships. How do we be in healthy relationships as followers of Jesus? And it was awesome. You can go back and listen to that on Spotify if you want to check it out. Um, but this semester, we're going to walk through a book of the Bible together. And I think it is so important for us to learn how to study scripture together for a few different reasons. Um, one, it's really cool that we all get a tangible, most probably all of us have a copy of the Bible, right? You have access to one. Um, you even now have some of you, if you were here early, got two copies of um, some scripture, right? But not everybody, when the Bible was originally written, had access to the word in their own home. So what they had to do to study scripture is they had to go to their local church and they had to sit and study it with other believers. And a really cool thing about that is that when you're studying the word alongside of other believers, you have people that are gonna hold you accountable to not th take things out of context. And you're also gonna have different people to help bring to light different things that maybe you wouldn't have noticed. So things that I might notice that might stand out to me might not be the same thing that stands out to you. And so there's something beautiful about getting to study God's word together and learn from each other together. So that's what we're gonna be doing this semester and how Vespers is gonna work if this is your first time. Who's, whose first time is it here tonight? Lots of you, well welcome, glad you're here. Also, if you want to later go to the vista.tv slash college and fill out our connect card so we can know you're here and then Kaylin, my assistant over there, or I will reach out to you um, sometime this week. But how this is going to work is this is a very discussion-based time, okay? So you chose to come to a church tonight that you don't have to just sit and listen to a pastor talk for 30 minutes. So congratulations. Um, hopefully you're excited about that because I think it's important for you to hear from each other, not just me. And so what's going to happen is I'm going to teach a little bit, set up our text, and then I'm going to present a question or two and give you time to talk about it at your table. And then we'll kind of discuss it as a large group and see what we can learn from each other's tables. And then we'll do that one more time. Sound good? Awesome. So we're going to be in 1 Peter together this semester. Um, some of you got these little Bible journals that has 1st, 2nd Peter, and Jude. We're just going to be in 1st Peter together. We're going to really break it down and hopefully get in the nitty-gritty of it. But I hope that you guys can take notes and follow along and that these are helpful for you. I might try and order some more next week if so some of you who didn't get one could have some. So, first of all, 1st Peter is a letter. And if we're gonna read someone else's mail, it's pretty important that we try and understand the context of this letter, right? So if we were to just read someone else's mail and we didn't know who it was coming from or who it was going to or what was happening around, what caused this letter to be written, it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense to us and it probably wouldn't be very meaningful or impactful. And in the same way, when we study scripture, any scripture, whether it's a letter or not, it's really important that we try our best to understand who is writing this, why are they writing it, who are they writing it to, what, what's important here. And so I want to spend some time trying to unpack that a little bit. So why is 1 Peter being written? Who is it being written to? Um, second, it's also a circular letter. So what a circular letter means is that it wasn't written to one group of believers. 
It wasn't written to one church. So there's some letters that we have in the New Testament, like Ephesians, that is written to a specific church, or Corinthians is also written to a specific church. But 1 Peter is a circular, circular letter, which meant um, the author, Peter, wrote it to be passed around, again, to a certain group of people, but not a specific church. So just a fun fact to know there. And then the author is a dead giveaway. It's Peter. Um, Peter wrote this book, or this letter, but actually the person who physically wrote it down is Silas, or Silvanus. Um, if you turn all the way to the end of the book in chapter five, when Peter's closing his letter, you'll see that Silvanus is the one that was writing it for him. I don't know why he needed someone to write him a letter. Maybe he didn't have good handwriting and he figured it was better to have this other dude write it down. But Silas was also a really important person that um, journeyed along with Paul in ministry. So Peter is our author. And so we know quite a bit about Peter because he is a pretty popular character in the Gospels. So for our first table discussion, I want to spend some time investigating Peter and seeing what we can learn about him, because I think it will help us appreciate the letter that he's writing a little bit more. So I'm going to throw up, we have eight texts up here on the screen, and for your first table time, and I was trying to do you a favor too, not making it super personal for the first one, so we can get comfortable, get to know each other a little bit better. So you get to talk about someone else first, which is cool. Um... So we're going to read these passages, and I want you to learn about Peter. Who is he? So if, if you need someone to take notes at your table for you, or maybe you all want to write it down, but who is Peter? What do you learn about him? What does he struggle with? What's his call? Or what, what's cool and interesting about him? Okay, so those are just some broad questions. I want you all to do some research and see what you learn about Peter. So let's throw those texts up on the screen. And y'all can, each person at your table can take turns reading one. Um, most of them are really short. So ready, go. All right, y'all ready to talk about it? Okay, so what did you guys learn about Peter? Who wants to start us out? Okay, so we learned that Peter is very, very human and that even time after time Jesus proved his worthiness to him, he still was like, oh no, like, I don't, who's Jesus? I don't know what that guy is, like, I don't know. Yeah, don't know. yeah. And then, yeah, so, and then at the end, the last one, Jesus was like, hey dude, like, I'm kind of tired of, like, asking you <laughs> to, like, trust in me, you know, and he was like, ah. Oh, like, you don't even have to ask. Like, obviously I do. Like, I love you. And then, yeah. So we learned that he's a little troublemaker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he made a few mistakes, huh? Who else? What was interesting? What would you learn? Um, so our table, uh, we just discovered that um, he struggled with knowing that Jesus was going to be crucified. I mean, Jesus tried to tell him. He was like, that'll never happen. And then, you know, it just kind of goes with, like, Jesus gracing him. Like, he doesn't understand God's plan for mm -hmm. what was supposed to happen. Yeah. So. Yeah. And he, even when, like, Jesus made it really clear, he struggled to release control. For sure. Um, so, something we found interesting, you know, whenever, uh, he was, uh, walking on water and then, you know, he stumbled, we were just talking about how Jesus, you know, he's always there to, you know, pick us up, even though we're in times of, like, you know, doubt yeah. and stuff like that, so, yeah. Yeah. Even Peter, who literally got to experience as Jesus presence still doubted, right? And Jesus was right there to pick him back up. That should be encouraging, right? Who else? Talking on the mic isn't scary, I promise. 
Actually, I was terrified when I first started <laughs> talking on a mic, so it is a little scary, but we've all been there. Something that we talked about, um, there was a couple things that like I never thought of and a couple people at our table, I was like mind blown. One thing is that he's very like passionate and almost like a childlike faith mm. of like, he's very naive to the situation, but he's also like super quick to act. Like he cut off a guy's ear. <laughs> like he's very passionate and will like hot headed and like will think on his feet, but then also is very doubtful. So it's that very like childlike naive faith. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's good. Like, it shows you how human he is, right? I mean, we all want to react out of our emotions. What was his job before he started following Jesus? Fisherman, yeah. It's not the most important job that you could have. Um, he was, oh, we got someone else? Okay. Um, in the last verse, when he's, Jesus kept repeating, like, watch my sheep or feed my sheep, um, we point out that Peter was very much just saying that he loves him and is more of um, more talk than bite kind of thing. And so Jesus was kind of saying, prove it. Like, do actions. Don't just keep saying, I love you, I love you. But, like, do something. Yeah. And I kind of wonder if, I mean, it had to be intentional three times after Peter just denied him three times, that Jesus is like, I'm going to make you say you love me three times. Get back at you. Anyone else? So Peter was also in Jesus's inner circle, right? We read about how he was one of the three that got invited to go off and pray with Jesus. So that's pretty cool to be one of Jesus' best friends. Um, what did y'all think about when Jesus says, I'm going to wash your feet, and Peter's like, no, you can't wash my feet. What does that tell us? He knows he's not worthy. Yeah, he feels unworthy. Maybe struggles with just humbling himself and allowing himself to be served, too. Yeah. So we, we learned a lot about Peter, right? But I want, I want you to realize, first of all, that Peter is a real human, just like all of us. Because I think sometimes when we come to the scripture and we read, we think that these people that wrote the Bible aren't relatable. I know for me, it just, it feels so far off and distant. Sometimes it even doesn't feel like I'm reading from a real person, right? Because it's hard to imagine what, what their life was like then or who they were. And so I think it's really important to remember that these people are real. They went through similar struggles that we go through with our faith. And so I think I want you to remember these stories about Peter as we continue to read his letter and kind of think of maybe what situations that he went through inspired him to teach some of the things he does. But remember that he's relatable and he's human, um, just like us. So we're going to jump into 1 Peter, starting in verse 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 5 tonight. That's it. And learn a little bit more about who Peter is writing to. So I'm going to read out of the NASB version in my Bible, and then this is ESV. You probably have a bunch of different versions, so I think it's fun to kind of compare and contrast different wording. Okay, First Peter, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, so he's introducing himself, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Capp Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ 
from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Okay, so that's kind of a lot packed into five verses, right? I had to read it like a bunch of times to even try and understand what Peter was trying to say. But he's, he's letting us know who he's talking to here. So there's a few words he uses to describe these people he's talking to. So I want you all to circle them in your Bible or your journal. And what are some of these words that he's talking, he's using to describe the people he is writing this letter to? What are some of the words? Oh, we cheated. <laughs> Elect, exiles, aliens, dispersed or scattered, okay? So these are the type of people that he's writing to, and these are important words to pay attention to, and we're gonna spend some time unpacking a little bit why these are important. So the first one I wanna think about is elect, or my, my version says chosen. Does anyone else say anything different? Elect or chosen. Um, so, this term is typically, in the Old Testament, was used to talk about the Israelites, God's chosen people, right, the Jews, okay? So now Peter is kind of making a statement here and saying this is going to cover a much bigger umbrella of people because right here he's actually writing to a group of mostly Gentile people who typically were not referred to as elect or chosen. But Peter is saying you are a part of God's chosen people. You're a part of his family, um, and so what elect means here is that those who are called or invited to live differently than the rest of the world. So Peter's saying the chosen people are those who are called or invited to live differently than the rest of the world. They're the ones who have decided to put their hope and trust in Jesus. And a little further down in verse 2, he explains a little bit more what it means to be the chosen or the elect. So he says, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, so that means like God has a purpose. He's working. He's moving. He has a plan. By the sanctifying work of the Spirit. So sanctifying is one of those churchy words, right? That sometimes we don't really know the meaning of, but it means um, through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, it, it's an act of continually being made holy. Okay, so it's a continual act. When you choose to follow Jesus, you are continually being sanctified and made holy by the Holy Spirit. So that's happening to these chosen people. They are also choosing to obey Jesus and then to be sprinkled by his blood. And so what Peter is referring to here is this Mosaic Covenant, which you can read more about in Exodus chapter 24. We're not going to read it tonight together, but if you want to do a little more research, there's this Mosaic Covenant that it was very normal for God's people to say, hey, we're going to commit to being obedient. We're going to make this commitment to God to be obedient, and then they're going to follow it up by killing an animal and sprinkling the animal's blood on themselves to kind of seal that commitment. So Peter's leaning into that imagery, but this time, instead, he's saying, you're choosing to be obedient, but you don't have to kill an animal to be sprinkled by the blood. You're sprinkled already by the blood of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross, right? So he's saying, if you are saying you're going to be obedient, and you're, then you're accepting the sacrifice and the blood that Jesus poured out for you. So that is enough to seal this promise. So those things, those are what you, he uses to describe the chosen, the elect, those who are accepting God's purpose and plan, who are being sanctified by the Holy Spirit, practicing obedience, and are being um, covered by the blood of Jesus, accepting that sacrifice. So that also means that all of us in this room who are choosing to follow Jesus are also a part of the elect and God's chosen people. So this matters for us as well, right? So then that takes us to the next word, exile or alien or stranger. So what, what, are, what do these words mean? What's an exile or an alien? 
Anyone? Someone you don't know, yeah, maybe someone who um, isn't from a certain area or someone who's outside of their true home, right? So Peter's addressing these people as exiles and aliens. Um, And so when you think about that term, what does it truly mean to be an exile or an alien or a stranger? It means that you, you probably don't fit in with the cultural norm around you, right? You probably don't quite understand the cultural patterns and you, you're different, you stand out. People realize, hey, that person doesn't really belong here. And so that's the type of people that Peter's addressing because these people are being persecuted by the Greeks and the Romans because they have chosen to follow Jesus. And the Greeks and the Romans are like, we want to make it really clear that you're outsiders and you don't belong here. And so Peter is writing to encourage them as strangers because it's hard not to fit in, right? It's hard when people notice that you're different and that you're not fitting in with the cultural norms. So I want you guys, all of you freshmen in the room, to think about a week ago, you moved here, right? And upperclassmen, y'all can think back to when you were a freshman, get a little sentimental, and think back to when you moved to Belton, Texas. Um, And you were probably a little nervous, right? You didn't know what you were getting into. For the UMHB students in the room, um, you didn't know what the culture of UMHB was going to be like, what it would be like to, to fit in there, how, how you were supposed to dress or what you were supposed to do to have fun. Um, you probably felt a little weird coming to Belton Temple because you didn't really know where anything was, right? So it was scary and intimidating. And my guess is you're willing to do just about anything to fit in, right? Because you don't want to stand out. You want to fit in with the norm. You don't want to have to be different. So I think back um, to my time in college, and I, I was on the volleyball team, and I, um, so when I <laughs> was trying to get to know everybody and figure out how I was going to be a part of this team, I quickly learned that the culturally normal thing to do with my teammates was to go to parties and to go out and get drunk. And that was something that I had never experienced before coming in to college and not something that I was necessarily looking to experience. But I pretty quickly just made this shift. And as soon as I was around these other people that that was the normal thing that they did, I jumped full in and was joining right along because it was more important to me to fit in, to be accepted, to not be a stranger anymore. And I'm sure some of you can can relate to that story. But as Christians, as God's chosen people, we're called to look different than the rest of the world. And that's what Peter is encouraging these people. These people here that Peter's writing to are probably about at their breaking point. They're like, did we make the right decision to follow Jesus? Because this is really, really hard. It's really hard to feel like a stranger, to feel like an exile, to feel like I don't fit in. And so Peter's coming in to encourage them and say, hey guys, this is worth it. I promise you that this is worth it to put your hope in Jesus. You don't have to give up. You don't have to just give up all your um, ability to be different and to lean into Jesus and the Holy Spirit and what he's calling you to do to fit in with the cultural norms. And so I want to look at John 15, what Jesus says. There's a little delay in the slide. We're getting there. I can also look it up. John 15, 19 says, if you were of the world, the world would love its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world because of this, the world hates you. 
And so this, have you heard the, the term not to be, to be in the world but not of the world? So that's where this saying comes from, is this scripture. Because Jesus is talking here and he's saying, when you choose to follow me, you're gonna have to accept that you're gonna look different sometimes. You're gonna have to accept that you're not gonna fit in and the world is going to not like you sometimes. You're gonna have to look different than what culture says is normal and cool and fun, but hear me say this, that doesn't mean that you can't have a full and joyful life as a follower of Jesus. It just means you're gonna have to fight that tension, right? And you're gonna have that tension a lot over the next however many years you're in college. Some of you will be in college more than others, longer here than others. Um, but you're gonna have to fight that tension. Am I willing to be a stranger in this world and to live into the call to be one of God's chosen people, which means I'm gonna have to look different than the rest of the world, or is it more important for me to fit in? And I, I was there and I believed the lie for a while that I could just you know, do what was fun now, do what I wanted to do to fit in, and then one day down the road, I would take my faith seriously and let it radically affect my life. And I would just encourage you not to wait to do that, not to put that off, um, because there's a lot of pain and heartache when you choose the things of the world over what God defines as good for you. So, our next question is, when is a time you have felt like a stranger or an exile or an alien because of your faith? What reminds us that as Christians, we are strangers in this world? I also realized I forgot to mention that this is where our series um, title comes from. I couldn't help but play into this theme, Stranger Things, since it's such a big deal right now. Um, but this semester, we're going to be looking at what it means to be a stranger in this world as Christians and the things, the stranger things that we're supposed to do. Okay, so that's where that comes from. But y'all can go ahead and discuss at your table now. All right, we got to wrap up because we're running out of time. I, sorry, I know y'all are still talking. You can stay after and keep talking if you want to. We're not gonna talk about this as a big group, um, but I hope that hearing from each other was encouraging and knowing, one, that you're not alone in feeling like a stranger if you do in um, your school or your work or wherever you're at. Um, and two, maybe it inspired you. Like, man, there are definitely areas of my life where I've started looking way too much like the world and there's areas that I can grow and look different. And that is something that God wants for your life. He wants better for you, but it's also an opportunity to be a witness to the world. Because if we look no different than the rest of the world and we claim to be followers of Jesus, then why would anyone else want to follow Jesus? And we want other people to get to see the true joy that we get to experience in Jesus, right? Jesus was also the ultimate example of being a stranger. He came into this world in a way that people weren't expecting. People were expecting the Messiah to be um, this big, strong, powerful person, and he came and was born in a manger. And he wasn't even accepted by his own people, right? They didn't want anything to do with him. And he was willing to shake things up and do things that weren't normal, um, for other, uh, for the Jews, right? So Jesus is our ultimate example of what it looks like to be a stranger. And we're supposed to look more like Jesus, right? So we really should just feel empowered to live into that. <clears throat> I also want to notice that Peter himself was presented with a situation that he got to choose if he was going to fit in or if he was going to be different. And when he was sitting in that courtyard waiting for Jesus to be crucified and someone asked him, do you know Jesus? What did he do? He denied him, right? Because it was more important to him in that moment to fit in and to not be known and to not be judged for being a follower of Jesus. 
And it happens to the best of us, right? Like if Peter can be coming from this place now who he's, he's sold out, he's like, I'm gonna be all in for my faith now and I have found peace in being someone that's different. And he's trying to offer these people and help them get to the same peace. And I think we can also get to the same peace together in realizing it's okay and it's good and it's right to be different as followers of Jesus. And the cool thing is, we don't have to do it alone. You got a whole lot of people around you here tonight and maybe in your other spaces too, and we don't have to do this stranger thing alone. We can invite each other into this life of following Jesus and hold each other accountable and challenge each other and remind each other why we're doing this and what God calls us to. One last thing, this word scattered here, these people were probably literally scattered or dispersed from their homes, which meant that um, they probably experienced hostility from their family and friends, and most of them probably lost their inheritance, which was their livelihood. And I love how Peter ends this section. He's reminding these people who have probably literally lost their inheritance, and he's encouraging them and saying, There is inheritance far better than anything you could experience here on earth waiting for you in heaven. And this should get us excited, y'all, that we have a hope, that we have an inheritance, even if we experience hostility and pain and hurt from other people in this world because we're not choosing to fit in, but we have an inheritance for us waiting in heaven that is so worth it. And so... This is, these are the conversations that we're going to be having this semester. This is just a super broad overview, but I'm super excited for us to learn from Peter how to be strangers together. So let's pray. God, we're thankful for your people who we get to learn from. We're thankful for Peter, who was one of your close friends that we still get to read what he wrote to encourage other Christians, God. And I pray that we would be encouraged by that as well, that we would leave this space inspired to be different, to realize that we don't have to just do anything to fit in, but we are called to look different as followers of Jesus. So God, I pray that you would open our eyes to see where we have become too numb and molded into the things of the world and where We need to be more passionate and radically changed by you. God, we are so thankful for your love and thankful that you pursue us even when we mess up. You don't care about what we did yesterday or this weekend or last night, but you care that we are in your presence now. God, I pray that we would just lean into you and we would lean into the people around us that you've gifted us with. God, I pray that each person in this room, that you would surround them by like-minded believers who can encourage them and support them because we cannot do this alone. We love you and it's in your name. Amen.